Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at the Word of God, sacred scripture, and we do so through the lens of sacred tradition. That is, the tradition that comes to us from Jesus through his apostles and their disciples. Now, we'd love to have you be part of our show. You can do so by doing what these nice folks have done from Delaware, Texas, Atlanta, and other places, by coming right here in our live studio audience. We'd love to have you. But if you can't, then you can also call in. If you're in North America, you call 1-800-221-9422. Nine four six zero. That will not work outside North America, so you can call country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. 205-271-2980. And we'll, if you are international, we'll put your call right to the top. Now, you can also send us your questions and comments by email, writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com, or follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. Today, we are going to look into Gethsemane and see how our Lord was willing to make himself vulnerable in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as the time of his coming trial and torture and death approaches, we'll see the importance of Jesus turning to intimacy with his Father. So, we are still going through my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. You can get that at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com. And it is item number 81098, 81098. If you're following in that book, we're uh, beginning today's discussion at the bottom of page 79. Now, the first thing I want to do is set the uh, scene uh, for Gethsemane. It's, uh, there is the upper room, which is on the south western hill of Jerusalem. And you'd come down from that hill in the southwest corner of the city, and where we still go to see the upper room, in fact. And then they would walk down towards the Kidron Valley. Kidron Valley begins just a little north of Jerusalem, and it marks off this ravine. It's kind of deep, relatively deep, and it's a, it's a runoff ravine through that area, and that it's still used, by the way, for uh, cemeteries. Lots of people are buried in the Kidron Valley because the, our the faith is that Jesus will come to the temple area to judge everybody. The people buried near the temple mount apparently are going to be the first in line. There's always somebody that wants to be first. And that's Muslim and Christian and Jewish alike. So uh, you go across that valley. It's not real wide, but it is steep. And you go to the Mount of Olives. And at the base of the Mount of Olives is a garden called Gethsemane, or Gethsemane in, in our language. But Gethsemane, Shaman is oil. And in the, the, it would not, not for automobiles. Um, you know, Shaman or Semen is oil from olives or other vegetables. And gut, in Aramaic, get, uh, means a press. So it's an olive oil press. That's what Gethsemane means, the olive oil press. And you can see in a cave that there is an, a very ancient 
olive oil press. It's made of a large stone that they'd roll over the olives. They'd put them in baskets and squish them down and get the oil out that way. Now we see it called different names in Matthew 26 verse 36 and Mark 14, 32 is called Gethsemane. St. Luke refers to the whole mountain, just calls it the Mount of Olives. And some, and John simply mentions a garden uh, across the Kidron Valley. So he didn't give its name. The re, one of the reasons our Lord would go there is that the pilgrims going to Jerusalem for Passover were expected to eat their meal and spend the night in Jerusalem for the Passover. But there were sometimes a couple hundred thousand pilgrims. That's huge for such uh, uh, even a large city like Jerusalem. It still was a huge number. So they artificially extended the borders of the city to include the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you ever go there, you can still see there's a pole with a wire. It's not a telephone or electric wire. It's a wire to mark off the religious extent of the city. So by staying in Gethsemane, our Lord is obeying the Jewish law to spend the night uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Now, we also see, though, that St. Luke mentions in Luke 22, verse 39, that Jesus customarily spent time, and even spent the night, in Gethsemane. It's one of those places that people could go and stay. And going there as was custom is very much in contrast to something I mentioned weeks ago about going to the upper room. Notice that uh, I brought out some weeks ago that our Lord does not tell Peter and another disciple, uh, presumably John, which house to go prepare the Passover supper. He doesn't tell them the name. He simply says, you will see a man carrying a water jar, which was normally a woman's job, uh, work in their culture, and go follow him wherever he goes. So it'd be an unusual sign, and they do so, and by having the signal set that way, Judas Iscariot would not have known where the Last Supper was going to be. Our Lord did not want Judas to disrupt the Last Supper. Too many important teachings, and of course, the foot washing and the institution of the Eucharist were going to happen there. He did not want that interrupted by his arrest. But by going to Gethsemane, as was his custom, Judas would know exactly where to take the uh, police to go and arrest him. So that's, that's what's going on. And this is all setting up for what our Lord knows is going to be the uh, beginning of the uh, end of his life here on earth. So we are going to take a look especially at the version of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane found in Luke 22. It's found in Luke 22, verses 40 to 46. Not a real long passage, but very rich. It says, uh, as soon as Jesus came in, he gave them an instruction, said, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, think about this in terms of the Lord's prayer. Isn't one of the uh, petitions, lead us not into temptation? And we're going to see throughout our Lord's prayer that he is using his prayer, the, the Our Father, as a basis for the praying to go on in Gethsemane. It's as if the Lord's prayer was made 
for Gethsemane. And this is the first part of that. Now, of course, this does not mean that God is going to tempt anybody. Scripture is absolutely clear in St. James that, you, you know, God tempts no one. The evil spirit tempts us, and our fellow sinners tempt us. And sometimes I don't need any help at all. I do fine on my own because of the disordered desires that I have. When, when I pass by an ice cream store, I have to pray that prayer, lead me not into temptation, Lord. <laughs> so this is something that, that we can do on our own. But we also know that our Lord may well lead us into places where we will be tempted by one of those sources. That happens. We see that, for instance, when our Lord goes into the wilderness and it is the Holy Spirit who leads him into the desert, as it says in Greek, in order to be tempted. Because there are times when the evil has to be taken on. We are in a battle against evil. This is a war between righteousness and sin. And there are times when we will be led by our Lord into the temptation so that we can defeat the evil at hand, as our Lord did in the wilderness. That's one of the things here. He's praying, uh, teaching them to pray because temptation is going to be strong when they are in Gethsemane. And then we see a very important parallel. If you've, some, uh, a couple of years ago, I went through another book on my Bible study on the Eucharist. And when I did that, I brought this up, and I'll bring it up again, because it's an important parallel, that on Yom Kippur, which our Jewish brothers and sisters will be celebrating fairly soon. Uh, you know, they recently celebrated uh, Rosh Hashanah, the, the New Year, and then on the 10th of the first month of their year, they celebrate the Day of Atonement, a day of prayer for sin. And before the temple was destroyed, the high priest had to offer a sacrifice of a bull for his own sins and a goat for the sins of the people. Interesting ratio of the importance of the offering. But at any rate, they, one of the things about the night before the Day of Atonement is that the younger priests would be there to keep the high priest awake throughout the night. They didn't want him to uh, sleep. As a matter of fact, you can see this in the Mishnah. Mishnah is a collection of rabbinic teachings that was collected from about 35, excuse me, 135 BC, unfinished in 200 AD, so about 300 years of their tradition. And in the tractate called Yoma, which is named after Yom Kippur, but in Aramaic it's Yoma, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, if the high priest sought to sleep at night, the young priest would snap the middle finger against the thumb before him, like that. And they would say to him every so often, my master high priest, stand from your bed and chill yourself once on the floor and overcome your drowsiness. And they would engage him in various ways until the time would arrive to slaughter the daily offering. And by, by keeping his, himself cool, uh, they mean walk barefoot on the stone floor at night. It would be chilly in, in the autumn or in the spring. So this was the job of the young priests. However, here in Gethsemane, the high priest of the new covenant is Jesus Christ. He's a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, as Hebrews chapters 5 through 10 make clear. 
And he is going to have to be the one to keep his newly ordained priests awake. They, he wants them to stay awake with him, but he's going to have to keep waking them up. They're not going to be as diligent about staying awake with him and watchful as were the priests of the old covenant. So um, we, we see that our Lord tells them to pray because as we've been pointing out throughout the, the, my book, the apostles' weaknesses, sins, and failures were well known to our Lord. He chose them anyway, but he knew their weaknesses, and that's why he's trying to encourage them. And then we see that he withdrew about a stone's throw. So when you go to Gethsemane, there is a cave. And you can, it's right next to the tomb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, in fact. And that cave is where the apostles would have waited. That's where the Gethsemane, the, the oil press is. You can see one there. And they, most of them were there, um, eight of them to be exact. Three of them came with Jesus a stone's throw away. Okay? And that's where the church of the agony is to be found today. There's a, the rock of the agony is inside that church right in front of the main altar. And this is the key element of Gethsemane. Jesus went off there to pray. This is his main task in this night. And he turns to his father. And notice the intimacy with which he addresses God the Father. In Luke 22, verse 42, he says, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We also see in Matthew 26, ver verse 39, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then in Mark 14, verse 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Underlying these prayers is, again, the Lord's prayer from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That petition from the, the earlier part of it is the basis of our Lord's prayers. And, of course, he is concerned about his upcoming suffering. He really is concerned about what he's going to undergo. He prays, remove this cup. And we'll talk more about the cup in a little bit. Um, and, you know, we see that in all three of the Gospels. Remove this cup from me. But the key issue, while he's aware of the upcoming suffering, he knows that he's there to do the will of the Father. That's why he teaches us the petition, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it means thy will be done by us, making our own lives in conformity with the will of the Heavenly Father. This is going to be crucial. And I think to have a, a strong sense of being with Jesus in Gethsemane when we face difficult choices about doing the will of the Father. This is going to be key. We'll take a break then. We'll come back and we'll start by talking about what did our Lord mean by the cup? And we'll go on from there to see how his prayer continues in Gethsemane. So please stay with us.
to invite you to start marking your calendar for next July, July 17th to the 21st of 2024. Already looking ahead that far. Uh, because that will be the National Eucharistic Revival Meeting in Indianapolis, Indiana. This is a movement to restore understanding and devotion to the Holy Eucharist here in the United States, and you can be part of it. If you simply go to EWTN.com slash Eucharist to learn more and receive a code for discounted registration. So get there before the selfish people show up. <laughs> oh, what a goof. All right. So let's uh, get back to this text. Now, at the end of the last segment, I brought up that our Lord, you know, uses this term cup. You know, he asked the Father to take away this cup. What's he talking about? The cup refers to suffering. And this is something that is present elsewhere in the New Testament and in the Old. If you remember in Mark chapter 10, verse 38, when John and James asked, let us sit one at your right and one at your left. And I, as I said, as we covered that passage earlier this year, that uh, they probably would have started fighting. I'm older. I should be on the right. You're younger. You should be on the left. No, they, th this was all about their ambition. And our Lord said to them with great accuracy, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? So he already had spoken to them about a cup that would be hard for them to take. And, of course, he's going back to the Old Testament. For instance, in Psalm 75, verse 8, it says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he will pour a draft from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. This is a cup of punishment and suffering for sin. So that's one passage. Another one is Isaiah 51, verse 17, where it says, Rouse yourself, rouse yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl of staggering. So here we see that it is a cup, and in both the psalm and in Isaiah 51, it is a cup that the Lord has, a cup of suffering as punishment for sin. In both cases. So that's another element. And then we see, again, the same kind of imagery used in Isaiah 51, verse 22. Thus says your Lord, the Lord your God, who pleads the cause of his people, behold, I've taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. Now this is all in reference to the punishment that the Lord had inflicted upon Judah for having broken his covenant. If you remember, both the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah had taught that the, the people had broken the covenant, it was done, and they were going to be punished with exile. Now, in this section of Isaiah 51, which is composed a number of years after the exile, so the exile was in 587. This is around the year 540, 539, right, and almost 50 years later. And 
he's telling them, okay, you've suffered enough, and he's preparing them to be able to go back home to, to their own country. But he still uses this idea of the cup of suffering that the Lord hands out. And we see that all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, emphasize the connection between Jesus' prayer and the imagery of the cup of suffering and the bowl of God's wrath. This is what's going on here. Now, there are a couple elements of this. First of all, the evangelists are very well aware our Lord does not look forward to the suffering. This is good sense. No, we're not called to be in, in pain, but given the reality of the world, pain is inevitable. And for a variety of reasons, sometimes our own sin brings on suffering. If you don't believe me about that, ask a drunk the next day, not the day when he's drinking, but the day he wakes up from his drunk that he's brought on his own suffering. Sometimes there's suffering for other people's sins. How many times people have to pay for damage done by family members, especially parents who are responsible for a child, sometimes have to pay damages if the kid does something that causes damage. And sometimes life with its difficulties has suffering in it. We don't like it, but and nor are we meant to like it, and our Lord didn't like it, but we do endure it. And oftentimes it's something that we have to accept. In the case of our Lord, he didn't do any sin. He, as, as the Bible says frequently, Jesus was like us in all things except sin. He's like us in every way except sin. So why is he getting this cup of suffering and punishment? It's what we had talked about last week when we went through Isaiah chapter 53, that he bore the sufferings of our sins. So he is taking this cup of suffering in order to suffer for us. This is key to that prayer. And he doesn't like the idea, but he will take this suffering and accept it from the Father as necessary for the promotion of the kingdom of God, to redeem sinners from condemnation and to open up heaven. He will suffer the wrath for our sake. That's one of the things going on. Now, something that has been a very much part of our tradition is that our Lord spent this time of agony not just considering the suffering he's about to undergo and not just thinking about the sins of the apostles around him or the people of his own time. But it's been part of our tradition that Jesus in his infinite deity was also considering the sin of human history and going forward as well as backwards because he's going to redeem all those who died before him and he's going to have his redemption for all of us who come after. This is why it is so important that it had to be the infinite and eternal God who would suffer on the cross for us. Only God could do that. And we see how human history up through that point had been filled with cruelty and sin and viciousness, selfishness all kinds of grave evils throughout human history. Think of the many wars, the 
enslavement of large populations and just mass murder of people who are not even combatants. This was one of the things that's going on. And don't want to forget the lies, the deception, betrayals within family, adultery, and all the rest. But he also was well aware that after he died, sin would not come to an end, that there would be continuation of sin. And as human beings became more aware and more knowledgeable, they were able to commit even wider ranging evil so that the most violent century in the history of the world was the 20th century, not the time of the Romans. In fact, in all the wars up until 1900, it was about 114 million people died. In the wars of the, from 1914 to the end of the century, and you can include maybe the Russo-Japanese War of 1903, but if you include that, it's 305 million people were killed in wars. And these were not religious wars. No way. This is something completely different. It's wars of atheists, communists, national socialists, the Nazis. And he could see that. He could see the genocides of the 20s. The 20th century invented genocide. And now we, we talk about the evils of slavery in the past. Meanwhile, we talk about the past slavery. There are more slaves now than there have ever been in the history of the world. The number of people brought from Africa in slavery between about 1600 and 1810 was 12 million. That's so many people. It's horrible what was done to the African people. But today, there are about 45 million slaves. This is the reality. And our Lord knew of this. And mo many of them were very, are in the sex trade because of our sexually gluttonous society. And our Lord had said at the Last Supper that Judas would betray him and that Peter would deny him and the others would run away. He knew it. But he also was aware of the future throughout the history of the church. Priests and monks and nuns would be unfaithful to him. Some would be heretical. Some would be licentious and commit uh, sexual sin. And it's not something brand new. We have a terrible run of it right now, or we did it a few decades ago. But it happened in the past at different times. As a matter of fact, I would urge you to read. There's a, there's a New English translation. You can look it up. It's called The Book of Gomorrah. It's by St. Peter Damien. And this was in the 11th century. And he's talking about the widespread corruption in the church. Uh, beginning with the papacy uh, of his uh, early childhood. And then there was reform. Well, these are the things our Lord knew about. Peter's infidelity would continue in various popes over the centuries, especially the 10th. 10th century was the worst wasn't so hot in the Renaissance, other times too. All of this is on his mind, and this is what our Lord contemplates as he makes that decision to do not my will, but the will of the Heavenly Father, so that all of these sinners could possibly find redemption. This is the key of Gethsemane. Okay. Let's stop there. We'll pick up again next week from that point. I want to st start taking some of your questions. I'm going to start off with Rebecca in Illinois. Rebecca, what can we do for you today? Hello, Father. I just want to praise you and your team for um, the good job you did with the road versus away stopping abortions. 
Thank My you. Is the um, how do we stop the child? Do it's going on today. Female to male, male to female, to stop our sexes of reproduction. Um, we wanted to know why they are stopping our chances of um, mutilating children to um, stop reproduction in our society and world today. Yeah. Yeah. Your expertise how to stop the child abuse that's going on today for the parents or the teachers or who's ever um, leading these children. Yeah. The, Rebecca, thank you. Um, there are a number of things about the, the transgender issue. And first of all, all of us have to become better informed about what's actually happening. What goes on? in transgender surgery. As you mentioned, the, the person who has the, the surgery never changes their own DNA. Whatever DNA they were born with, XX if they're female, XY if they're male. None of that DNA changes. They remain the same. And the, it's the sexual organs and secondary sexual organs and reproductive organs that get uh, mutilated, in effect. And the hormones of the opposite sex are then given to that person. What does that do? Take a look at a guest I had on my show back in May, Dr. Quentin Van Meter, M-E-T-E-R. Dr. Quentin Van Mater. Dr. Van Mater uh, is a pediatric endocrinologist. He studies the glandular system and the hormones and the effects of them. It's the most complicated system in the human body. And he is reporting from studies done, long-term studies from Europe where they've been doing the transgender surgery going back to 1960. And he brings about from that research, longitudinal studies over 30 years of patients, that their life expectancy is reduced by 50% they cut their life expectancy in half. 42% of them try suicide, many completing it. And this is what they're promoting? Are they trying to kill off the children and make sure they don't reproduce? Because as our vice president had said, we're going to reduce the population of the country and then you'll have better health care. Remember that? I don't think she's alone in thinking this by any means. She's right. she, she didn't make that up. This is part of what a lot of people think. And this is one way to do it, to get people to volunteer. We have to educate ourselves and start talking to children. And at an early stage, you parents, keep those lines of communication about everything open with your children so that nobody in a school system can get them to keep very important life-threatening secrets from their mother and father. How is that right? When I was a kid, they couldn't give you an aspirin. And now they can encourage you towards a change of identity and surgery without parental information, and they're protected from the state, and the parents could lose custody in some states, like California, so that a child can do something that will reduce their life expectancy by 40 years. These are the things we have to learn about, the truth of human beings. And open up and start talking to your children so that they know, they can tell you 
what's going on in their lives and you can talk to them and you're not going to hurt them or anything. That's what they use as like, well, some of these parents will be mean. Parents, you're not there to be mean. You may be strict, but you're not there to be mean. And have that communication open up so that, you know, they, your children know they can talk to you first and that nobody who works for the state would have more authority than the mother and the father who gave life to those children. So that's going to be part of the key, okay? Well, we have to take a little break. We'll come back in a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. We have more questions from our studio audience and from you calling in. invite you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We will be speaking with author, lawyer, and consultant Monika Yablonska about lessons that we can learn about liberty from St. John Paul II and why his legacy and portions of his magisterium are under attack today. So she actually knew him. So this will be a great conversation. I'm very much looking forward to that conversation. Let's now go to another question we have from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Keller, Texas. Love having folks from the Republic. So what, <laughs> what can we do for you? I have a question you mentioned about doing God's will. Yes. And so we, the church, do God's will. That's what I think that you said. Yes. And so... Um, as far as you and discerning God's will mm -hmm. as a priest, Father Mitch, how would you go about discerning God's will? Yeah. Two things. You have objective norms and subjective norms. Objectively, it's essential that we obey the commandments of God and that he's, he, God is not going to have you need to do any discernment about whether or not you should murder somebody, rob them. You don't have to discern, should I rob this person? No, no discernment necessary. Nobody has to discern. Should, well, does God want me to commit adultery? No, no. <laughs> you know, dishonoring your parents. No, missing mass on Sunday. Don't got to discern that. You know, the, the, um, except for sometimes when you are dealing with someone who's sick. That's a different situation. Uh, but you don't have to, that's the objective norms. And this is why we study the catechism to learn the ramifications of the Ten Commandments and what they mean and the Sermon on the Mount about what's right and wrong. If you're all willing to do that, the subjective norms is that when you're choosing between two good things. So, for instance, the good of matrimony and the good of a religious vocation. Both of those are inherently good. How do you choose between them? And in that kind of case, it's more about where does our Lord give you peace that lasts? Not just an initial peace. Sometimes people feel a, a certain interior peace just because they finally made a decision. But does it last? And so you take time to make those vocation decisions. Uh, and you go ahead and follow where that interior peace is. Having a spiritual director or close friend who knows you to discuss those things, that can be very helpful too. Very helpful. Um, you know, I, I wrote a book called How to Listen When God is Speaking, and that's where I discuss that whole topic more in detail. So that may be useful. Okay. 
Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Bethany Beach, Delaware. Good to have you here. Thank you. I go from the second biggest <laughs> to the second smallest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so, so often the Alaskans like to remind Texas that you can put two Texas inside Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. So my 12-year-old granddaughter asked, um, so why would God create Lucifer if mm. he knew mm. that he was going to create evil in this world and take so many souls with him? Okay. A couple things you want to think about. First of all, God created Lucifer as a beautiful and good angel. He, that's how he created him. Have you ever made a birthday cake for your daughter? Mm -hmm. Did you ever have one that was kind of fancy in its decoration? Yes. And you did a lot of work to make it really look beautiful, knowing they're going to dive into it and cut it to pieces. <laughs> you can't leave it. It's, it's not the purpose just to leave it there. You, you take a risk that people will, you know, eat it. This is what our Lord, he made something beautiful, but with free will. And you, you know, have produced this daughter and, you know, you love her very much. There may be one or two days every few years when she disobeys, I'm sure. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> Not like Mrs. Paqua had to deal with her. her kids were just a mess. But you know, to, to but you you take that risk of having a child who could go a number of different directions, but you choose to love them, and you know do what you can through them, and some you know you you can end up with a child who would do great evil, but you can also end up with a Mother Teresa. So you don't know. And our Lord gave the evil one free will. And that's the risk God takes every time he creates any of us. And at that point, you're dealing with the mystery of why do people choose evil? And there's a wide variety of reasons for it, usually related to pride, where if you can imagine your birthday cake realizes how beautiful it is, and all of a sudden decides to throw itself on the floor before anybody eats it just so that nobody messes it up. <laughs> you know, that would be Satan. It would be like a birthday cake that wants to throw itself uh, to make sure that, no, I'm not going to let my beauty be marred or challenged. That would be one way to th start thinking about that. Father, where are you from? Diocese of Wilmington, St. Anne's, Bethany Beach, Delaware. Nice to have you. That, <laughs> Thank you. Is that a one diocese state? Uh, Maryland, and, uh, the eastern shore of Maryland and the state of Delaware. Okay. And right. it used to be a little piece of Virginia, too. Oh, so, yes. so they just cut you off yes. there, eh? <laughs> All right. So, so what can we do for you today, Father? I was wondering if you could reflect just briefly on the importance of the sacrament of penance uh, in our lives and also the great joy that I think any priest feels about someone who's come back to the sacrament after 20, 30, 40 years, and that those people really shouldn't be anxious or nervous because we're so happy and delighted that they're there, and we want to help them experience the peace and joy of the Lord. Let me ask you one thing uh, that I think I know the answer. I've never met you before, but I know this from knowing other priests. Do you remember all the sins people tell you? Never. Exactly. Never. Exactly. I, nor do I try. Correct. <laughs> it's not about me remembering it. It's like the, the Archbishop Sheen used to tell this story about this Catholic kid and a Jewish kid that argued, my rabbi is smarter than your priest. No, my priest is smarter than your rabbi. They went back and forth to find the Jewish, Jewish kid said, okay, maybe your priest is smarter. But that's because you tell them everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 the thing is, is that we don't remember, we don't try to, because that's not our role. Our role at that point is to be the voice of Christ, most especially a voice of forgiveness and mercy. That's our main role. And the, secondly, a voice of wisdom and counsel in a lot of circumstances. We can help guide a person to 
learning how to avoid the near occasions of sin and other issues. So that is our role. And, you know, the part I love about confession is not hearing what everybody tells me, but it's seeing the relief and the peace that begins to come into the soul as they walk out. And, you know, uh, I'm sure you, like I and other priests, have heard confessions for people who'd been away 50, 60 more years. And it is a great joy to welcome them back. This is when we get to live the prodigal son. You know, we, we get to be the father of, the, of people and welcome them back with open arms. You know, sometimes you have to encourage them to come back. And uh, in fact, one of the things I tell, you know, young couples on getting ready for marriage, just because you're married doesn't mean that you don't need confession anymore. And if you don't know what to confess, ask your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> They'll do the examination of conscience for you. They already have, and now that you mention it. It's the, you might have different sins once you're married than when you're unmarried. You know, the, the different stages of life, the sins might change, but you have to deal with all that. And it's the ongoing, not only confessing of sin, but just as important, if not more importantly, the ongoing reception of grace to help you avoid the sin. There really is a grace that helps to change from uh, committing sin. And so this is why, you know, frequent confession is very good and we priests are expected to go every week, you know, and that's, and that's, and it's a blessing. It's a blessing, you know, and uh, to, to get there every week and ask God's forgiveness. All right. Thank you, Father. That was good. Um, thank you all for being with us. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lead you in all of your ways by his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And, you know, this network was inspired by our Lord guiding Mother Angelica. And part of that inspiration was that it would be brought to you by you. Uh, no other network had in those days where it was like that. Uh, everybody depended on advertising and sending, uh, selling subscriptions. Mother knew she had to give it away, but depend on you to keep us on the air. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you all and thank you. Thank you.